In the testimony of Luke, the Lord shares the parable of a certain rich man whose ground brought forth plentifully and who thought to himself, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to store my fruits. The man decides he will pull down his barns and build greater ones to make room to store all his fruits and goods. I will say to my soul, he says, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But before he could begin his new project, and although he, as a wealthy man, surely had the resources to accomplish it, God said unto him, You fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose shall all those things be which you have provided? So shall it be with him who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We can't discuss the topic of physical preparedness without also focusing on becoming rich toward God, lest we too lose our souls even while our storehouses are full and our freeze dryers are running. During this message, I hope to focus on three points. One, the scriptures, and specifically the Book of Mormon, prophesy of the last days, tribulations, and destructions. Two, the destruction and sweeping off of an untold number of souls from the earth will be as a result of the world's collective rejection of God's true servants who cry repentance in order to rid their garments of our blood. Three, the best way to escape the coming wrath, violence, and destruction is to discern between true and false messengers and hearken unto true ones. I want to add a disclaimer as this is a rather heavy topic. I've been enjoying myself today learning all these great skills, and I don't want in any way to... uh, create fear or promote any kind of wrong haste, which always usually leads to uh, not a so good outcome. And I certainly don't wish to trifle with the souls of men. But God's true servants, who I will point to in scripture, often speak of such things when they're found among us and for good reason. The prophet Enos proclaimed, and there was nothing save it was exceeding harshness preaching and prophesying of wars and contentions and destructions, and continually reminding them of death and of the duration of eternity and the judgments and the power of God. And all these things stirring them up continually to keep them in the fear of the Lord. I say there was nothing short of these things, and exceeding great plainness of speech would keep them from going down speedily to destruction. The goal, of course, is to have faith, not fear. But before we can have true faith and salvation, we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Only when we obtain his perfect love is fear cast out from us. We must repent, perhaps even nigh unto death. And because we are so often hard-hearted and vain and foolish, speaking of the Lord's judgments today, focusing on what's in the scriptures to to be reminded of what is coming, of what's at stake, hopefully can be of some benefit. We recently commemorated the 21st anniversary of 9-11. My family and I were living in Baltimore at the time of the attacks. My wife is originally from Long Island, New York, and her father worked with countless people in the World Trade Center towers at the time. I'll never forget the things we witnessed that day. Watching people jumping from buildings, watching buildings fall to the earth, believing that we may know people inside of them. One of my friends who I just saw last week had ignored the announcement that morning to stay on their floors in their offices to shut down and back up their computers when the first tower was hit. 67 people from his company from the 88th and 89th floors of the second tower heeded the advice to stay put. My wife and they were killed along with hundreds of others that he personally knew. My wife and I went to New York City a few weeks after the attacks. The streets were uncharacteristically quiet. Pictures still posted everywhere of missing people. There was an eerie reverence in those streets. We saw hundreds of stores still closed, blocks away from the towers, still knee-deep with dust and debris. When we came upon the wreckage, knowing that people's children, spouses, parents, and loved ones were buried under it, We literally could not believe our eyes, nor ever thought 
we could comprehend such tragedy. 9-11 gives us a glimpse and a feel for how such tragedies affect and devastate real people, all of whom have loved ones they leave behind. The Lord might say in the scriptures, O ye fair ones, and yet the destruction the Lord has in store in the last days will be far more expansive and far more reaching and devastating than even 9-11. Nephi warns us, and great and terrible shall be that day unto the wicked, for they shall perish. And they perish because, and we'll talk about this more a little later, they cast out the prophets and the saints and stone them and slay them. Wherefore, the cry of the blood of the saints shall ascend up to God from the ground against them. Wherefore, all those who are proud and that do wickedly, the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, for they shall be a stubble. And they that kill the prophets and the saints, the depths of the earth shall swallow them up, saith the Lord of hosts. And mountains shall cover them, and whirlwinds shall carry them away, and buildings shall fall upon them, and crush them to pieces, and grind them to powder. And they shall be visited with thunderings, and lightnings, and earthquakes, and all manner of destructions. For the fire of the anger of the Lord shall be kindled against them, and they shall be a stubble. And the day that cometh shall consume them, saith the Lord of hosts. The best warnings we have of what is coming are indeed found in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith taught that it's the most correct book on earth and the keystone of our religion and said that a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. It's literally a warning from the dust prepared precisely for us at this exact moment in history so that we can learn the mistakes from the mistakes of previous civilizations and hopefully, hopefully repent and live. Moroni warns us what will happen if we too become wicked. He does, he does this as he's re relaying the account of the Jaredite destruction where both men, women, and children being armed with weapons of war, having shields and breastplates and headplates, and being clothed after the manner of war, did march forth one against another into that last great battle that would end their civilization. Moroni says, and now we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land. For all we know, he's writing these words from upstate New York, that this is a land of promise and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve God or they shall be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them. And the fullness of his wrath cometh, cometh upon them when they are ripened in iniquity. For behold, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. Wherefore, he that doth possess it shall serve God or be swept off. For it is the everlasting decree of God. And it is not until the fullness of iniquity among the children of the land that they are swept off. And this cometh unto you, O ye Gentiles. This meaning the record, perhaps even more specifically, the record of ether. That ye may know the decrees of God, that ye may repent and not continue in your iniquities until the fullness be come. That ye may not bring down the fullness of the wrath of God upon you as the inhabitants of the land hath hitherto done. Behold, this is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, who has been manifested by the things which we have written. Moroni's contemporaries, like the Jaredites, became so debased that they universally plummeted into theft, violence, rape, murder, and even cannibalism after having been a civil and delightsome people only a few years before. And the husbands and fathers of those women and children they have slain, Moroni tells us, and they feed the women upon the flesh of their husbands and the children upon the flesh of their fathers, and no water save a little do they give unto them. And notwithstanding this great abomination of the Lamanites, it doth not exceed that of our people in Moriantum, for behold, many of the daughters of the Lamanites have they taken prisoners. And after depriving them of that which was most dear and most precious above all things, which is chastity and virtue. And after they had done this thing, they did murder them in a most cruel manner, torturing their bodies even unto death. 
And after they have done this, they devour their flesh like unto wild beasts because of the hardness of their hearts. And they do it for a token of bravery. Oh, my beloved son, how can a people like this that are without civilization and only a few years have passed away and they were a civil and delightsome people? But, oh, my son, how can a people like this whose delight is in so much abomination, how can we expect that God will stay his hand in judgment against us? Behold, my heart cries, woe unto this people. Come out in judgment, O God, and hide their sins and wickedness and, and abominations from before thy face. Early American author and novelist Alfred Henry Lewis made this statement in 1906. There are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy. Think about that for a moment. The veneer of civilization is ever so thin. And those who feign civility often turn out to be the most depraved, especially when law and order are gone. Do you remember the news footage of the police officers shopping with all the looters at the Walmart after Hurricane Katrina? Imagine what happens when not just a relatively small levy gives way and 1,800 souls are lost, as tragic as that is but when the seas heave beyond their bounds, killing potentially millions, or when a third of all mankind dies, as is prophesied in the book of Revelation. In speaking of our day, the Lord said, and it shall come to pass that among the wicked, that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. Among the wicked, by the way, seems to imply anywhere in the world outside of Zion. And it continues, and there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war with one another. In other words, the entire planet will be engaged in the exact kind of genocide we witness in the Book of Mormon. In a conference of believers in 2017, it was stated, the language of scriptures gives a description of the events now underway and calls it the end of the times of the Gentiles. This process with the spirit withdrawing will end on this continent as it did with two prior civilizations in fratricidal and genocidal warfare. For the rest of the world, it will be as in the days of Noah, in which as that light becomes eclipsed, the coldness of men's hearts is going to result in a constant scene of violence and bloodshed. The wicked will destroy the wicked, end quote. And among those people, potentially, killing each other for food, for tools, in self-defense, defending their properties and their loved ones, may very well be people that we know and love, who either didn't give heed or we didn't warn sufficiently. And of course, all that's assuming that any of us here is actually fortunate enough to be qualified for that city of safety. When the Lord showed Enoch the destruction at the time of Noah, Enoch wept and refused to be comforted, and was stunned to also find the heavens weeping. How is it that you can weep? Enoch asked, seeing you are holy and from all eternity to all eternity. The Lord replied, Behold, these your brethren, they are the workmanship of my hands. Summarizing, they are without affection, they hate their own blood, and Satan is their master, and misery is their doom. And the whole heavens shall, shall weep over them, even all the workmanship of my hands. Why should not the heavens weep? Seeing these shall suffer. Then the Lord says unto Enoch, and this is interesting, As I live, even so I will come in the last days, in the days of wickedness and vengeance. Notice that it says the days, as if to distinguish them as perhaps the most wicked and most filled with his vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made unto you concerning the children of Noah. And a day shall come that the earth shall rest, but before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulation shall be among the children of men, but my people will I preserve. But before that day he saw great tribulation among the wicked, and he also saw the sea that it was troubled and men's hearts failing them, looking forth with fear and with fear for the judgments of the almighty God, which should come upon the wicked. 
The resurrected Lord's first coming to this land can serve as a type and a shadow of the kinds of things that may take place when he comes again. In 3 Nephi, as the Lord describes to those who survived the utter destruction of dozens of cities and millions of people, of their loved ones, their kindred, buried in the sea and earth, burned to death, carried away in whirlwinds, as those who survived lie in a complete vapor of darkness, weeping, howling, mourning. The following condensed passages will demonstrate why they were destroyed. In another place, they were heard to cry and mourn, saying, Oh, that we had repented before this great day, great and terrible day, and had not killed and stoned the prophets and cast them out. Then would our mothers, our fair daughters, and our children have been spared, and not have been buried up in that great city, Moronihah. Change the name of the city to Salt Lake, or New York, or Baltimore, or Provo. And thus were the howlings of the people great and terrible. And behold, that great city Moronihah have I covered with earth, and the inhabitants thereof, to hide their iniquities and their abom abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come up any more unto me against them. And behold, the city of Gilgal have I caused to be sunk, and the inhabitants thereof to be buried up in the depths of the earth. And waters have I caused to come up in the stead thereof, to hide their wickedness and abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come up any more unto me against them. It continues, and I'll skip forward and mentions that the blood of the prophets and the saints should not come up any more unto me against them about three or four more times. And it finally says, O oh, all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they, will ye now not return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? Yea, verily I say unto you that if ye will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now it came to pass that after the people had heard these words, behold, they began to weep and howl again because of the loss of their kindred and friends. But eventually their mourning was turned into joy and their lamentations into the praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. And thus far were the scriptures fulfilled, which have been spoken by the prophets. And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved. And this next part is key. And it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not. And it was they who had not shed the blood of the saints who were spared. And they were spared and were not sunk and buried up in the earth. They were not drowned in the depths of the sea. They were not burned by fire, neither were they fallen upon and crushed to death, and they were not carried away in the whirlwind, neither were they overpowered by the vapor of smoke and of darkness. And now whoso readeth, let him understand, he that hath the scriptures, let him search them, and see and behold, if all these deaths and destructions by fire and by smoke and by tempest and by whirlwinds and by the opening of the earth to receive them, and all these things are not unto the fulfilling of the prophecies of the many of many of the holy prophets. In the book of Mosiah, we read, And who shall be his seed? Behold, I say unto you that whatsoever that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for a remission of their sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, for they are heirs of the kingdom of God. In the glossary of the restored edition of the scriptures, we read, quote, salvation is tied to accepting prophets actually sent by Christ, not pretenders he has not spoken with. That may bear repeating. Salvation is tied to accepting prophets actually sent by Christ, not pretenders he has not spoken with. And then it continues. Joseph taught whenever men can find out the will of God and find an administrator legally authorized from God, there is the kingdom of God. But where these are not, the kingdom of God is not. 
If man can find anyone sent by God, there is the kingdom of God. This is a true principle. Someone is sent to declare a message. Any who hear and hearken will become his seed. This is how men and women obtain faith, and faith brings them to meet God. We will find redemption, hear his voice, and become holy because his word is in us. We will have no doubt about our, salva- our salvation because he will declare it in his own voice to us. End quote. The scriptures teach that no man can be saved without faith, and faith comes from hearing the word of God from one who is sent. Without faith, one could say, without the testimony of his true servants, it is impossible to please God, and it is equally impossible to be saved, no matter how prepared we may be otherwise. Lehi surely had tents and provisions, and he knew how to make jerky, apparently, among many other important things. But he and his family were saved because he believed the holy prophets who were preaching the destruction of Jerusalem. He then became a prophet, and this is precisely how the doctrine of Christ works and how it's supposed to work for us. And thus he joined in the teaching. As is almost always the case with true servants, Lehi and Jeremiah and others were threatened with death, and in Lehi's case, he was warned to flee. It was not just his prepper skills that saved him and his family, although I'm sure those skills helped along the way. They were saved because they found and believed the words of true prophets who came, by the way, from outside their current church church structure. Sadly, most and nearly all people living at the time of a true servant in the history of the world have not been able to recognize them, especially while they are among them. This is even truer for the leaders of the church, for the leaders of churches. Jesus says to them, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, church leaders, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers of them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you are witnesses unto yourselves of your own wickedness, and you are the children of them who killed the prophets, and will fill up the measure then of your fathers, for you yourselves kill the prophets like unto your fathers. And so it is today. Our scribes and our Pharisees, the leaders of our churches, how many of them actually prophesy or see or reveal anything from heaven? And yet they speak claiming authority and compel others to obey and hedge up the way. Moroni saw all our churches and our leaders and proclaimed, O ye wicked and perverse and stiff-necked people, why have you built up churches unto yourselves to get gain? Why have you transfigured the holy word of God that ye might bring damnation upon your souls? And your churches, yea, every one have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. For behold, ye do love money and your substance and your fine apparel, and the adorning of your churches more than ye love the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted. O ye pollutions, ye hypocrites, ye teachers who sell yourselves for that which will canker, why have ye polluted the holy church of God? Yea, why do you build up your secret abominations to get gain and cause that widows should mourn before the Lord and also orphans to mourn before the Lord? and also the blood of their fathers and their husbands to cry unto the Lord from the ground for vengeance upon your heads. Behold, the sword of vengeance hangeth over you, and the time soon cometh that he avengeth the blood of the saints upon you, for he will not suffer their cries any longer. Joseph Smith taught that the world always mistook false prophets for true ones. And those that were sent of God, they considered to be false prophets. And hence they killed, stoned, punished, and imprisoned the true prophets. And they had to hide themselves in deserts and dens and caves of the earth. And though the most honorable men of the earth, they banished them from their society as vagabonds. While they cherished, honored, and supported knaves, vagabonds, hypocrites, imposters, and the basest of men. In other words, true prophets are not likely to ever throw the first pitch of a professional baseball game. Would we have recognized John the Baptist had we lived in his day? He's probably the greatest example because he's the last prophet of the Bible before the Lord comes. He was not a church leader. He dressed poorly, had no standing in the community, and like his father would eventually be killed for his testimony. 
I can try to envision the scenario and the quandary. Suppose you have a friend who went down to hear John preach. Your bishop and stake president have warned you and others to publicly not go near him. In fact, to do so would lead to church discipline, excommunication, or worse, maybe even death. And so in the name of obeying your priesthood leaders, you keep your head down and you listen to and follow those qualifying as authorized priesthood channels, no matter how excited your friend is about this new message. You're a good and honorable man in your community. And after all, you certainly don't want controversy and no one wants their wife and their children and parents and siblings to lose respect for them. And so you don't go hear John. You don't listen to his talks in person or online. You don't order his books on Amazon. And you definitely don't get rebaptized in the living waters of the River Jordan like your friend does. Unlike your friend, you keep your calling at the local synagogue, working with the youth, and your job and income are not put at risk like your friend who is losing his good reputation as someone who keeps his eye on the church's leaders and who can be relied upon to sustain them. As a result, things are good for you. And from a distance, you watch your friend throw away his life, his good name, his lands, his wealth, his family. His parents and siblings barely reach out to him anymore. And eventually, after his false prophet is silenced, instead of being deterred as you had hoped, he doubles down and leaves his home with his family to follow a strange, unorthodox man who John referred him to. He eventually gives everything to him even all of his sins. And when he's cast out, rejected, stoned, and eventually crucified, you think to yourself, I'm so grateful to have listened to my good and faithful leaders who I know cannot lead me astray. There is so much comfort and safety in numbers. And look at how wise these men are to keep me away from such unnecessary controversy. Unlike my friend, I continue happy in my life with all my family around me and can attend church and the temple as a member in good standing, it's proof I made the right choice. In conclusion, the days of the Gentiles are coming to an end. Violence and destruction are upon us as the result of our condemnation and collective neglect and casting out of the prophets in the Book of Mormon and those who have been sent already among us. According to the scriptures, this rejection will at some point lead to a repeat of what's happened here on this land already twice before. We would do well to get prepared physically and spiritually, and ideally, like Lehi, find and hearken unto a true messenger, repent, flee Babylon, its falling, and oh, how great will be its fall. We cannot assume or vainly hope that our prophets are not false. We must judge and we must come to know lest the blood of the true prophets, who we may also be casting out, even if only through our carelessness, comes upon us in the days of tribulation and destruction fast approaching. The custodians have found a lone phone and 